Hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk, Expecting Greatness from Trino, a ludicrously fast query engine. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about, well, of course, my favorite query engine, Trino, but uh, I'm going to be talking to you primarily uh, gearing towards an audience of people that are using uh, great expectations and talking about how great expectations in Trino uh, are these two fantastic technologies uh, that, that work super well together. Um, you know, don't have to explain it to you all, but, you know, great expectations obviously fills in a lot of the gaps. Uh, anytime some data team is trying to build out uh, a bigger uh, data shop or something like that, essentially uh, it could be a data warehouse, could be uh, obviously traditional RDBMSs, um, could be all sorts of different things across the spectrum, uh, so let's say Elasticsearch or Pinot, uh, real-time systems, things like that. And along the way, you essentially need to v validate that data. And so um, anytime you have a, a system uh, of, of any level of complexity, it is very useful to basically take stock at different points in time and validate that uh, you're getting what you're expecting. And so uh, so that is no different from with Trino. In fact, I will argue in this talk that it's all the more uh, important for Trino because we ultimately have uh, the ability with this, and I'll, you'll see this here in the architecture slide here shortly, to connect to a lot of these systems that I just mentioned. And uh, it actually uh, is all the more pertinent whenever you know you have a query engine like this that can kind of fit its way into a lot of these different use cases. Uh, it's you know very much useful to to be able to uh, you know, integrate these two and have the ability to to, to validate using Trino across all of these different planes uh, in the data architecture, right? So um, so my name is Brian Olson. Uh, I am a developer advocate at Starburst. Uh, I work very heavily in the Trino community and uh, I try to basically uh, make sure that we're healthy, we're happy, we're growing, and uh, we're ultimately helping each other out. And so um, if you want to uh, talk to me after this, uh, my tag on Twitter and on everything is bits on data dev. Um, I'm on, of course, Twitter, GitHub, uh, LinkedIn, a lot of the other places out there. I can't even think off the top of my head, uh, but definitely you can go and find me. If, uh, if, if you think I'm on a platform, just search that name and that'll be me. <laughs> if, uh, uh, unless you go to something very random, maybe not so uh, data related. Um, so let's go through the quick overview of, of uh, how we're going to go through this talk. So first and foremost, I'm going to cover a uh, Trino architecture. And that's going to basically uh, be just this like top level view, um, kind of giving you the basic idea of what Trino is. And then we're going to actually talk about kind of more of the why. Why, why do we have this uh, system? Uh, take a step back and uh, go through a little bit of the history around Trino. Um, and ultimately, as we're doing that, I'll kind of be mentioning some of the features that developed along that history, and that's going to help us understand even more so those features and what makes Trino super special, uh, helping those of you in the great expectations community to kind of understand why Trino is so, so special and so important, um, and then where great, great expectations then fits into that whole narrative. Um, and so uh, we'll then cover a couple use cases, uh, in particular uh, one that will motivate our, our demo, and then I'll finalize the uh, talk with um, notes and resources. So Trino architecture. Um, tr so what is Trino? Trino is this um, SQL query engine first and foremost, and uh, that is to say it is a query engine and not a database. Um, it's distributed, so it has a coordinator uh, that is the kind of brains of the operation, uh, the one that is kind of doing a lot of the taking in the queries, parsing them, analyzing them, um, then doing some planning and scheduling uh, across these different workers, right? And so the workers obviously is the secret sauce of the, you know, being able to be distributed and uh, do a lot of uh, querying in parallel, which gives us, you know, these super fast speeds, um, which we'll talk about in a second um, as we talk about the history. So. So it's a query engine, not a database. Um, although you know, a lot of times people see the handle Trino DB, and they say, "Oh, DB, it must be a database." And that's just because we needed a handle uh, Trino.com or Trino IO. Uh, uh, well, Trino IO wasn't taken, but uh, but essentially uh, any anywhere else you you look, Trino is very much already taken. And so um, so we had to use a handle, and that's Trino DB. But it's not a database. 
Um, and so what does Trino do that's kind of different than a lot of these other query engines that are out there? Um, well, you know, the first thing that uh, Trino was created to do, and we'll talk more in this, is that uh, it was created to talk to data lakes and uh, maybe originally you called it, you know, big data warehouse uh, with Hive. Uh, it was replacing a lot of that slow, really slow, clunky runtime uh, that people were experiencing with Hive. Um, and then, you know, at fast forward to today, we're, you know, kind of talking to these other table formats uh, that, that do a lot better with cloud storage, like Iceberg. Um, you see that one on the bottom right here. And that gives us, uh, you know, all this ability to basically uh, talk to these files sitting in S3 or HDFS, uh, primarily S3 nowadays, and, uh, and be able to map that into SQL tables. And so, uh, so essentially Trino totally replaces in, the, in this particular case, uh, totally replaces the query engine and then the storage and metadata are just modeled in, in different uh, areas of, of the system, right? In Iceberg's case, it's all on S3. In Hive's case, there's a, there's a small like Postgres or MySQL database that sits on the side and holds all the metadata that does all that translation. Um, then you had a whole bunch of other cases where you can talk to uh, Elasticsearch, uh, you can talk to Postgres, you can talk to Mongo, um, even more recently with these real-time systems, Pino and Kafka. And so uh, now you're able to actually not only talk the language of all these different things, especially something like Elasticsearch that, <clears throat> excuse me, has its own uh, has its own query language, query DSL, and is very complex and you know has a lot of specifics to in terms of how you search it. And we've you know kind of done a lot of the the you know mapping of how do I take this a SQL query and I'll essentially map it and and push that query into Elasticsearch. Um, and so. Uh, what Trino then enables you to do is I can now perform a join on Mongo uh, to you know my Hive connector, and now I'm able to uh, essentially query my data lake and then merge that with some operational database like Mongo or Postgres or MySQL. So that's really uh, some powerful stuff that you know uh, in some of my older companies, you know, we had dedicated services that we had to maintain to to be able to do things like this. And so now this is just kind of automatic and immediately exposed through a very common uh, interface, which is very well known, SQL. And so SQL is like one of the key pieces in terms of how our clients actually uh, interfa interact with uh, the coordinator. And so that is, uh, you know, kind of the, the bird's eye view of what Trino is kind of accomplishing. Um, and uh, and kind of why it's uh, it's a very special thing. Now we'll go into more details about why uh, here in a second. So let's take a step back though to really get the the understanding you know of of why this is so important. So you know, if we look at uh, where things were just you know in the very beginning of of all this analytics uh, craze of you know hey we we are doing all this cool stuff with databases um, but. Uh, right now, I, I you know I, I have databases sitting in marketing, uh, sales, and all these other different departments. And I need to actually have one place to actually like query them all. Oh, and by the way, these are all in like different data stores. And so, uh, if you look at this top right here, uh, data warehousing became the solution um, to basically query data across all these different data sources and uh, you know, basically get them into a common schema in a common location, and that was the, the data warehouse, right? So you extract data from all of these, um, all of these different s systems and put it in a staging area. You transform the data in that staging area until it is basically in this pretty kind of star schema uh, setup, and then you push that into the data warehouse. And ultimately, people can then know that, oh, okay, well, there's this table that uh, gives me answers when I need have these types of questions and these tables over here that give me answers to, you know, things with these types of questions. And so um, this trend really grew in the kind of, it, it started in like, you know, our Really like 70s, I think it depended on Kimball or, or uh, if you think Inman was the one that created this, but, um, you know, 
uh, 70s, 80s time is when it was kind of created, the initial concepts. And then it grew into popular in like the eight, late 80s, early 90s. So, if, you know, those of you that want reference for, you know, what this time was in the real life, I like to think about what's going on in pop culture at the time. So, you know, we're all walking around with our Sony Walkmans. I was listening a lot to this band Eiffel 65 and this like uh, song Blue Davo D. And uh, really the only database work that I was doing at the time was uh, actually with a Pokedex and just trying to, you know, capture all the Pokemon I could uh, for Professor Oak. Um, so, you know, in essence, uh, that's really where this was going on. This was very hot and heavy for quite a few decades, um, or quite a few, uh, maybe let's say a couple of decades. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially it worked really well. You copy data from one database to a, to a source using, uh, and by the way, this, this process here is called ETL. And you're optimizing for reads down the line and, and saving on caching for these common queries. But, you know, new things came along. We obviously, you know, uh, with the turn of the century, uh, we started to see a lot more internet usage uh, through social media, through phones, uh, people having, you know, kind of mobile phones a lot more uh, with, with a lot fancier browsers, things like that. Uh, people uploading a lot of their videos into th this thing called YouTube and uh, showing everybody their, their uh, you know, 50 hours of cat videos. And so, you know, this became a really big problem in terms of the data sense and like we, we had a, 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 all these kind of vertically scaled systems that weren't able to keep up with this influx of data. And so, you know, lo and behold, there's, you know, we're like, well, we have this big data problem. So what are we going to call this? Oh, this is a whole category. It's called big data. And so Hadoop uh, was one of these first open source systems that really uh, became available to companies that were trying to fit in with this new uh, wave of, 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 you know, massive amounts of data. And, um, and so people just immediately just jumped onto the wagon. They said, okay, our, our data warehouses aren't scaling anymore. We need to do this distributed thing. Well, that was great thinking to some degree, but it was just like, the problem is, is that, uh, you know, Hadoop, uh, had only one way to actually access that data. Um, it was a distributed system. So they had a very, you know, kind of fancy, uh, framework to, to, to address querying that, which was called MapReduce. And so you essentially had to write this custom Java code to actually run the data on there. And that was really cumbersome, uh, not easy to hire a lot of people that were experts in this. And so, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, while, while it solved for the, the scalability issue and making sure that, you know, you're not having this giant thing, monolith of a system that will just shut down. Uh, and once one, the one engine shuts down, then it's, you know, lights out for everybody. Uh, you know, if you have a couple of these commodity hardware things, uh, break down, well, then you're fine. But now we can't get the data out. We can get the data in, we just plop it in there, but then, you know, what's going to happen? How do you get the data out? So the first one of the first uh, you know uh, iterations and open of open, uh, things that got open source for uh, to address this was called Hive. Uh, so this was a couple of developers at Facebook. Uh, they made this SQL on Hadoop solution that basically took in SQL uh, and mapped that into those you know clunky MapReduce operations, and uh, and essentially uh, gave you that opportunity to say, hey, now we can actually query this stuff. Great. Um, but there's still a problem here is that, you know, effectively people were still struggling really heavily with, uh, how long this took, uh, ultimately, you know, the, the systems, particularly Hadoop, Hive, uh, they were performed, performed to, uh, to get the job done, uh, not necessarily to get it perfect. Uh, you know, so results were kind of iffy and not really thinking about speed and time. It's basically saying, Hey, we are giving you this solution to even possibly possibly, you know, run these queries in the beginning. So, you know, you should be thankful, <laughs> but at the end of the day, nobody was thankful with people needed answers faster and quicker. So, um, so fast forward four years later, uh, you know, in a same company, Facebook that created hive, uh, they were, you know, dealing with a 300 petabyte data warehouse with all this stuff. And, um, and so uh, they they pulled on these engineers, Martin, Dane, and David, uh, and, and Eric Huang, uh, that later, very shortly after, joined the, uh, the, the team. And they all came out to uh, work on this system that was going to replace Hive, uh, effectively still doing the SQL, uh, very, you know, uh, standard SQL. Um, and, uh, but, but being able to, uh, run it over this established Hive system. And so this system was called Presto. Uh, it was created in 2012. 
um, from the get go, these uh, these three, well, actually these four, including Eric as well, uh, really, really pushed for, uh, you know, making sure that Presto is open source. Uh, they were wanting to not only just facilitate the needs of Facebook at the time, but this was a much larger space that they wanted to actually solve the problems and actually make, you know, Presto a, a more robust and, and valuable system to a larger audience and therefore bringing in, you know, the issues of others will also, you know, bring in uh, a lot more robustness to uh, the, the different types of use cases you can solve, right? So, um, so the biggest kind of tenets of this was like, it's open source, we need everybody's kind of opinions in on how to make this a better system. It just works was a big part of it was like, I want this to just basically be something people can install, um, put together, and it's going to all work. And then uh, fast interactive query analytics. Uh, we don't want to have the uh, the issues that these you know data scientists and BI people and, and and even software engineers were facing at Facebook at the time. In fact, uh, the anecdote was you know I can't run more than, if you run six hive queries in a day it was a good day right so uh, we don't want to have that anymore so we want fast interactive uh, analytics um, and then correct results as i mentioned before you know hive was kind of like a you know kentucky woodenage ballpark type of results that you would get and it was more about you know kind of getting the idea uh but the the the, the um engineers here wanted to really achieve a system that can actually deliver really correct results. And then obviously having this be standard space, not creating a, a custom SQL language to meet the needs and maybe somewhat get close to and reflect what's going on internally in the system. No, let's focus on keeping it standard SQL, very declarative, very unknowing of the underlying systems. Um, and, and then essentially make that a lot more portable as well as uh, just, you know, better better from a uh you know up ramping different teams different people that might use the system don't need to know this like special syntax for just presto they can learn about other things jdbc was another standards as well um that and and various others are used so a little further down the line so 2012 as we mentioned the the open sourcing of presto happened uh sorry actually that's 2013. um and then later on uh 2018 uh you know the the project is is incredibly successful uh it's growing massively in adopters especially in the the silicon valley area and uh it's just uh really taking off in terms of uh the the popularity um and so at this point you know facebook really needed uh their particular needs met when it came to uh, how to add things into essentially how to add things and, and how to update things for for Presto for its needs. And so um, they tried to kind of unilaterally control the governance aspects of the project. And this didn't really sit too well with the founders wanting this to re remain a very community driven project. And so um, when this kind of decision came down and there was really nothing they could do about it, the founders quit and went to create a fork that they call Presto SQL. And so, um, so in 2019, um, uh, Facebook applied for the Presto trademark. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, very, very shortly after, uh, the, the two projects were for a while, like I think about a year or two years uh, after that split, uh, we're both called Presto, so you'll see a Presto DB and a Presto SQL. Uh, Presto SQL was the fork that the uh, the uh, founders created, and um, they they ultimately had to rename it to Trino in 2020 uh, due to that trademark. So um, so ultimately, you know, I wanted to put those names out there because you might see different things, uh, and and so uh, just to clarify, um, so the project ultimately in in the side of Trino, you know, once there they were kind of like uh, once Martin, Dan, and David were really kind of free to uh, really continue building what they had initially set out to build. Uh, as you can kind of see here, you know, the trajectory practically stayed the same as they moved on. And then, uh, you know, the Facebook project kind of started to dwindle a little bit. So, um, so now more or less, you know, if you're wanting to deal with the system, the community driven uh, version or, or kind of a fork of that is, is now called Trino. Um, so, as we kind of mentioned, you know, there were these these use cases that kind of uh, uh, circled around RDBMS use cases, data platforms, data lakes, and, and NoSQL databases, all these potential needs that people had to query this data on on different, you know, like uh, uh, essentially 
uh, federated queries being able to run these. So one very popular example is DBT. Um, you know, a lot of people complain a lot of times that you can't actually query more than one system when you're using DBT. But if you're using Trino by default, you actually are able to to run this type of uh, join query as part of one of your models in DBT. Um, another very popular version of this is uh, people that use Mongo or other NoSQL systems. Uh, also, even um, you know these real-time systems that don't support joins. Any any uh, database that doesn't support a join now, you can actually kind of have a uh, pretty fast way of of implementing a join using Trino as the query engine that does the join between the same tables. So you could have two tables in Mongo that you can now join together. Uh, whereas that is something that's not really possible. Uh, with the system itself. So it opens up this like really cool query federation use case. Um, and that was initially, you know, that interactive and, and query federation was a, a very driving feature that uh, brought Trino uh, very, a lot of popularity. Now, one interesting thing is that in early days, there was not a lot of people using it for ETL or batch queries. And so more recently, we've we've introduced uh, failure recovery for batch workloads, um, including you know this ability to have more adaptive planning, resource management, and fine grain failure recovery. Which means that if you're running this really long query engine, long being you know a, a couple hours or something, and a task uh, does fail, you're actually able to recover from that. That wasn't included in earlier versions of Trino because we were essentially trying to avoid the extra overhead that it would take to actually save that state internally. So uh, you can learn more about this uh, failure recovery mode that you can turn on in Trino and basically, uh, you know, have one Trino cluster that's maybe more of an ETL cluster and another one that's still your interactive fast uh, query cluster, as everybody's come to know. So. In summary, Trino is this ludicrously fast query engine. Um, it's not a database. Uh, it, it's fast because you're able to actually uh, run uh, on this MPP architecture. So it kind of goes against some of these initial uh, kind of uh, MapReduce tenants and really tries to think about non-blocking operators and as best as it can uh, pipeline and stream everything that it can in parallel uh, to avoid any kind of, of slowness that you might see in the in the system. Uh, in, meter, in memory federated queries across all sources, that's another big uh, feature of it. And then, you know, fault tolerance uh, more recently being added to simplify the scaling of ETL. So in other words, you know, light speed was really just too slow. We have to go right straight to ludicrous speed. So uh, those of you, I apologize if you don't know Spaceballs, you should check it out uh, if you uh, like stupid comedy like I do. So. Um, so now where does great expectations fit into all this? So Trino enables a lot of awesome usage patterns. Um, it, uh, you know, as we kind of mentioned, it's, it has these federation capabilities. So, you know, you can think about it as like, a, it could be an ingestion engine that pulls uh, data from up source, uh, upstream, and kind of pulls uh, different, uh, from different locations, merging it into a particular location. So, you know, we have this uh, operation or SQL statement called CTAS or create table as, and that allows us to basically say, create this new table. So this is the destination as and then you just basically just define a sql query there so you say select something from this table join this table that now i can ingest from multiple uh, uh federated query sources or even just from one right ingestion can simply just be copying from one to another and then that's where we're kind of getting into that etl batch workload so you know doing etl where you're kind of doing copies and possibly some transformation in between that is uh, another kind of like essentially doing that at scale, trying to scan an entire you know table uh, or, or or data set, uh, and then moving it into a, a different part of the pi uh, the pipeline. Uh, that is you know kind of more what recent these recent uh, fault tolerance capabilities uh, bring into Trino. Uh, interactive queries, you know, so if you have uh, BI or data science. Uh, folks that that really want to play around with the data, but they don't want to move it and do that ETL up front. They basically just want to have uh, the world at their fingertips. And so you have Trino kind of connected across the entire org. Uh, now they can actually do that. What, what we were able to do back in data warehousing days, but they don't even have to do that upfront ETL. They can basically just interactively start playing with the data. And once you've kind of worked, you know, worked in that interactive mode and are moving
removing that, you know, kind of like to have your mind made on like, okay, this is going to be a really cool model to build or something like that. Let's, let's productize this and actually scale this up. So the same SQL that you wrote in that interactive exploratory phase can now get copied over and then get applied to that ETL batch workload without having to change anything, which is incredible. Um, and then, you know, you can also do these embedded use cases where, you know, you have these like systems that uh, are all across your org and you have an application that needs to talk to all of those, you know, a customer facing app or something. Uh, you can also use Trino in these particular use cases as well, because now you don't have to have a special service for that. You can actually have uh, Trino uh, be, be essentially the, the service that connects all these different data pieces together. Um, so, you know, becoming ubiquitous, and here's my kind of point for the talk, exposes a lot of that surface area where things can go wrong. And so this is really where great expectations falls in for, line for Trino. Uh, being able to be this kind of uh, omnipresent system that is just literally everywhere in your org uh, also brings a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, anxiety to maybe to some of you, uh, because now all of a sudden you, you have, uh, the keys of the kingdom in one spot. And so you data quality is, is, uh, you know, obviously security and governance and all these other pieces are, are a big part of it, but data quality is yet another big piece that needs to be looked at whenever you have a system like this, that, you know, kind of has its hand in all the different cookie jars. So let's look at a big picture, like solid, you know, example of what, what I'm talking about here. So you know, we, we have Trino, uh, two, two instances of Trino. So we have a, a Trino that's deployed as kind of ETL and we have a Trino that's deployed as interactive. And so, uh, you know, you'll have uh, typically in a lot of these, and, and we're essentially going to say, like, let's do a data lake house architecture here. So um, this is one of many type of architectures that you can do with Trino, but, you know, this is, this will be the one that we'll use for, for the uh, sake of the argument. So you'll have, um, you know, essentially a, a, a orchestrator like Daxter could also be Airflow or any of the other ones that you use. Um, uh, Prefect, I think, will be the, the final one on that list that's very well known. And then uh, then you have uh, the the data format storage, which is Iceberg, and that sits on top of, you know, this could be uh, AWS S3, this could be uh, Azure Blob Storage, or uh, I can't remember the one off the top of my head for Google, but I think it's just Google Storage, maybe <laughs> Big Storage or something. And then, uh, and but you know, if you're doing on-prem or doing the example we're doing today, um, you can use MinIO, and that is a S also S3 compatible uh, compliant storage, and you know, it's the exact same as like having a cloud storage just locally on your laptop. So that's kind of the stack from uh, the you know Trino uh, to to fulfill the data lake and then you know to ingest data in uh, a couple ways you can go now for our demo we're just going to be having two flat csv files just sitting in minio already but you can imagine you know let's say you have an operational data store and so we have some pokemon data set that has all the pokemon and all their stats and stuff like that so it's going to be one table that we're actually talking about today in our example and let's say that that's sitting in postgres and you need trino to basically run that ingest part of that uh that that query so uh trino you know can talk to postgres can also talk to iceberg and so you, with a SQL query, can literally query this Postgres database, um, you know, create table in Iceberg uh, in some land directory and, um, you know, uh, select all from Postgres Pokemon data. And so, uh, so that's essentially... Uh, what you're able to do from the ingest perspective. Um, and then you might have some sort of real time Pokemon Go data that has some like, you know, geo data uh, that, that you can use to like uh, essentially, uh, you know, pull in different players or spawn in this particular case spawn locations but you could even think of something like uh you know player movements and things like that uh and uh you know figure out that one of the people playing pokemon go is near a starbucks and you want to push a starbucks coffee ad at them or something so uh so that is you know kind of the real time like uh, uh, ingestion portion that could be uh, in our case we're going to have two flat files already sitting in there for the demo but um so then you get to the this this kind of part right here um, so we're, we're, here's where great expectations kind of comes in. So you have data that's landing in your, your data lake house. Well, first off, we, before we even move anything or do anything, uh, from a, you know, maybe a Trino perspective, unless you've just ingested with Trino, um, you need to be able to validate that that data is correct. Right. So, so first step, uh, if, and if you look at this, I'm kind of thinking of this like left to right. So first you have left, uh, is ingestion. And then the first thing we have on this, you know, on this land part of our table is where the 
the the data is just landing in 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 the uh this these buckets um we we have a great expectations operation that goes in you know the daxter orchestrator uh, runs this and checks land and basically make sure that those tables are what we're expecting them to be. We don't want raw data uh, all the way upstream to basically be corrupted or have some sort of issue. And now we're, we're you know, everything downstream is going to have some problems. So we want to enforce uh, great expectations there. And then once that happens, then Daxter can move on to the next, uh, essentially the next operation, which would be Trino reading that data out doing another CTAS query. And again, this one's gonna be like, let's say a full scan or whatever, and, and that's gonna pull it up and then uh, write it back down into a secondary table structure, uh, which is called structure. <laughs> and uh, the reason why it's called structure is now we've taken this raw data, maybe like, so the CSV in, in one case, and we've transformed it into something like ORC or Parquet that is a lot faster and a lot more structured, right? So that's the kind of second phase. And then uh, we need to yet again, run another uh, great expectation operation to validate that data. And then finally, we'll take our structured tables and we merge them together and actually create a new table shape for the consume table to basically have our, our analysts and our BI folks, or maybe even have uh, some front end, you know, kind of embedded application where people can interactively uh, pull on this table to learn, uh, you know, about, about different things that are going on, right? Uh, what is the, uh, you know, kind of location that I find a lot of Bulbasaur or something like that from this Pokemon data. And as, as the data gets written into that consume, yet again, we should run one more great expectations. And then there might even be more or instances and locations where this could could uh, fall in, but this is just for the sake of the argument. So you you see uh, one thing: Trino is is involved in all three of these these lifecycle part aspects. Um, you know, ingestion to ETL pipelines into interactive queries, and so. Since Trino is so ubiquitous and so uh, uh, kind of all over the place in, in this architecture, um, having great expectations there to essentially back it up is, uh, I think, one of the the uh, you know biggest things that I'm trying to kind of get across in this talk and the, why these two things, uh, why these two technologies really are work so well together. So let's talk about a couple of these use cases and go into each of them. So we talk about landing. So in, in Trino is ingesting this data in, um, you know, could be a lot of different things, copy transform, just dumping a complex federated query. And so what are the things that we're gonna look at in this demo today? So we're gonna look at, uh, you know, the a couple of these expectations. Uh, the one particular one, uh, the row count is gonna equal something. Uh, we want to val validate that, uh, you know, the columns that we, that there's a, the specific columns that we're expecting to come in in the raw data uh, and that none of them are kind of like just di different or maybe we got the wrong file that landed there. And then expecting uh, the columns to be of a certain type. So we have CSV and in these particular cases, uh, we have uh, we have the expectation that they're going to be a, a varchar. So they're always going to be a string. So in this example, uh, we'll, we'll validate that they're always going to be varchar. And I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. The use case two is like once we're in the structure, uh, you know, we, we've now uh, modified and, and, and basically done these like casts, uh, basically getting going from a varchar into a specific type. So yet again, we want to actually do the co expect column values to be of type on a couple of these, especially making sure that they, they are what we expect them to be. Um, and then we definitely want to check the column values to be between some certain range, um, uh, especially validating that, uh, you know, uh, for, for this one in particular, like latitude, longitude is going to be between some range. And uh, obviously, we would still want to make sure the row counts correct and a couple of things. So, um, you know, more succinct structure, more capabilities to actually validate the values at this stage. And then the final use case that we're going to be kind of looking into is that consume spot. So we've actually done this shifting of the of the actual shape of of the final consume table that is actually going to get used by the the um, data consumers. And so we want to uh, again validate the row count. That just doesn't go away. Um, we want to make sure that the correct columns that we're expecting to end up in that final space is actually what uh, ends up being there. And then we want to. Um, 
um, you know, validate that there are no nulls whenever we're, you know, on, on certain columns that we're expecting to be very critical to some of the, let's say, uh, upstream processes or things like that, or, or particularly just what we need to query on. So data shape uh, has changed and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we just want to make sure that all of that stuff is still intact. So one thing to keep in mind, uh, a lot of people that, uh, you know, are, are working with great expectations already, you're usually working with like databases like MySQL here or Mongo, excuse me, and they already have um, a two tiered containment hierarchy. And what that means is, you know, when you're uh, working with like, uh, say like MySQL, you sometimes have to specify, you know, a particular database that you're talking to. Well, in great expectations case, it actually just spits out like the, um, it spits out the database and table, uh, options when you're, when you're looking through those. Now, uh, when you're talking to Trino, Trino actually, because it's able to talk to multiple systems, it has to have a third tier on that containment hierarchy. So where Trino calls a catalog, that doesn't exist in all these other data stores. And so uh, you have to specify that for every time that you set up a data source, you have to actually uh, set that statically in each data source. So every catalog that you have in Trino, you'll need to actually create a, sp a separate data source uh, as part of the URL. And this is fine because ultimately, you know, you're validating the end state of some table uh, that just got written to or, or created from from Trino. And so having that, uh, you know, basically have, have to do manage multiple data sources, it's a little bit of a pain, but it actually works pretty, pretty still pretty darn well. There are cases, you know, in other systems where, you know, if they don't have that catalog thing, it's a lot more of a, of a problem, but it's just something to make you aware of when you initially start trying to play with Trino, that's going to be one of those barriers. So as I was recording this, I uh, realized that I uh, ran out of a bit of time to actually execute on the demo um, and to actually get this within the time constraints uh, of, of this. So what I'm going to do is essentially uh, do a whole separate video uh, to do to run the demo uh, down the line, uh, and I will get this to you all uh, very, short, uh, very shortly. And... Um, basically uh follow along in that video uh, and and check it out uh, it's definitely really super exciting to uh to see these two technologies work together but for right now let's move on to kind of just the last couple points that i have uh, about this so um so notable pull requests and releases uh that that when did you know kind of trino support show up and do we do you all who are using great expectations out there have it yet um, so, you know, you could check out the ad Trino support uh, was the initial one that was added by Ken Wade. And, and I think he's done a good chunk of these, um, except for 5085 um, was contributed by, I think, it's like a community member. So, uh, but Ken, uh, thanks for your setting up on, on the adding this uh, uh, Trino support in uh, 0.15.4. Um, also improving that, uh, a couple uh, extra um, you know capabilities that were added from the SQL Alchemy side, uh, as well as uh, making sure that the test suite around it was uh, was uh, improved. And that uh, was in introduced in 0.15.6. And there's yet another, uh, you know, um, adding Trino dialect to um, the, uh, zero one five one six or zero fifteen one six or ha yeah, zero fifteen six uh is the version that also included uh, this this dialect inside of the that data set so um there's also an open p r uh there's nothing else in terms of like uh, functionality yet that's getting added uh, or performance but uh there's uh the trino docs uh this has not yet been released but uh if we go back here uh i can basically uh, offer this up to um, or offer this um, uh, slide deck to anybody that wants it as well. I'll, I'll hand this over to Kyle. Um, and basically, uh, this is a preview of the um, of the from the pull request uh, for the Trino database. So if you want some help in getting started with Trino um, and actually getting your hands onto it, uh, this will be probably contributed very soon. I think Ken's also working on this one, and so uh, so definitely check that out. Um, and then finally. Um, uh, and again, you'll be able to get these later, but, uh, 
you know, here's all the resources that I'd like to kind of give out to you all. Join our Slack channel. That's where a lot of like, you know, if you're new, wanting to learn more about Trino and ask a draw Trino and get involved in the community, uh, definitely, you know, find me on Slack and I can kind of, you know, get you in touch with the right people, depending on what you all, uh, you know, what you're trying to kind of accomplish or achieve, or even just playing around with Trino. I'm, I'm a pretty good person to talk to for getting started. Um, we have a, a community broadcast that goes out every month. Uh, currently, and we're hopefully going to increase the frequency back again. We used to do, do it every uh, two weeks, but uh, uh, it's called Trino Community Broadcast, uh, and you just need to go <clears throat> go to trino.io forward slash broadcast. Um, that also gets streamed to our YouTube, where we put up all sorts of other things, like the demo that I'll be uh, recording for this will also go up there. Um, give us a star on GitHub. Uh, we're at TrinoDB forward slash Trino, uh, and uh, you know, if any any kind of uh, recognition that we can get uh, from the community is always great and very uh, deeply appreciated. Um, and then uh, you know, follow us on Twitter uh, for any kind of updates. Uh, we we do frequently uh, post the release updates as well as a couple other uh, kind of community or uh, or kind of integration type updates. Uh, any kind of news that are that's going on. Uh, and then definitely check out Trino Forum. Uh, it's a uh, basically a complement to Slack that we're trying to have be uh, help out basically people find out about Trino uh, by searching stuff on Google. Uh, f- uh, forum is actually a really good way to kind of uh, surface a lot of that stuff that people don't typically find. And then finally, the last little link here that, that you'll find is uh, uh, the link to the demo that I'll be running outside of this. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm not here, obviously, in person to ask, answer questions right now. Um, but uh, I will, uh, again, find me on Slack. Uh, you know, Ken will, will direct you there uh, so that we can talk to you. And, and again, thanks for your uh, consideration uh, due to my uh, my our, our, our lack of planning and understanding that this was going to be running into my paternal leave. Um, so thank you all uh, for for checking out this talk. I hope you all check out Trino uh, and uh, really excited to get some ideas around you know how we further talk about the use cases around Trino and great expectations. All right, there it was uh, our first recorded. Demo. <laughs> uh, thanks everyone who uh, stuck around uh, after after a lot of time. Uh, you can find Brian on on our Slack, and again, like all the other places that he said to ask any questions. Um, yeah. So thanks everyone for coming, and uh, we'll uh, look keep, keep a lookout for that for those docs for Trino, and we'll see you next month. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.